Here are the exercises I think are best to build the abs, aka the six pack, according to the science. Welcome back, six pack shortcuts, aka Mike Chang here, bringing you another ketogenic fat burning diet and six pack ab sickening workout. Wait a sec, that ain't who I am. Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching, bringing you ab training science. Before we go into what the best ab exercises actually are, we need to understand what they do. And I think this is actually one of the most common mistakes in the gym. And that's misunderstanding what the abs are responsible for. Broadly speaking, as far as aesthetics go, I think we can group the ab musculature into three distinct categories. The first is the rectus abdominis, or the six pack muscle. The second is the obliques by and large, internal and external. And the third, is the transverse abdominis muscle. First, we have the rectus abdominis, and because it literally looks like a six pack, it is going to be the most important for our purposes here. Training it directly is going to be the biggest yield in terms of aesthetic improvements. Importantly, the rectus abdominis is responsible for spinal flexion. The exact thing you're told you need to avoid during the deadlift, having your spine round, is what you want to do when you're training your abs. Next, we have the external and internal obliques. Importantly, these are also responsible for spinal flexion, meaning that whenever you train your rectus abdominis muscle, you will get some internal and external oblique stimulus as well. However, these two muscles are also responsible for lateral flexion of the spine, so essentially bending sideways, and lateral rotation of the spine. And if you do have an oblique machine at your gym, in all likelihood, it is targeting rotation of the spine as a means to train the obliques. And finally, the obliques are also responsible for intra-abdominal pressure, or essentially bracing. Importantly, the obliques are not a muscle that you need to train 100% or else your physique is going to be awful. For a lot of people, if you do want to grow your obliques, it's going to be a case of, all right, let me do some direct oblique work once a week to get the highest returns I can on my time spend training obliques, you're not going to be isolating them four or five times a week. They're quite low for most people on the list of priority muscles to grow. It's very much akin to training your wrist extensors directly for a lot of people. And finally, we have the transverse abdominis. I don't think you need to worry about training it directly. And that's because the transverse abdominis is predominantly responsible for intra-abdominal pressure, that bracing action we spoke about earlier, that you would get sufficiently from a variety of compound movements like the squat and the deadlift in all likelihood. But Additionally, the transverse abdominis just isn't that big. It's not aesthetically impressive. And so for most people, if you're going for aesthetics, I wouldn't worry about it. Based on this anatomy, we have a few logical conclusions. One, we need at least one exercise to effectively train this musculature of the rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle, and the obliques. And that is an exercise that needs to involve spinal flexion. When it comes to muscles that are predominantly responsible for intra-abdominal pressure, just doing some compound lifting in your program, like some sort of squatting variation, some sort of deadlifting variation, will likely cover you to a sufficient extent when it comes to those muscle groups we don't care about quite as much anyways. So let's talk spinal flexion, because I think this is one of the biggest mistakes when it comes to ab training. And that's not understanding how to train the abs. A lot of people, when they're training their abs, are prioritizing a ton of hip flexion, which is the opposite of an RDL. You're essentially bringing your torso closer to your thighs, but they're not really changing spinal positioning all that much. You want to look like a cat stretching and someone performing a very round back deadlift during your ab exercises. You want to hyperextend your spine, getting a deep stretch in your abs, and you also want to crunch down in your spine, looking like you're pulling with a round back on a deadlift. Whenever you're training your abs, try and prioritize actual spinal flexion and extension as opposed to hip flexion. So we just learned about the anatomy of the abs. Now we know how to train them, but we don't really know what exercises to pick because there are a lot of exercises and some of them aren't very good and some of them are going to be better. What do we look for in a good ab exercise? Well, we look for the exact same things we look for in any good muscle growth exercise. And here's a list of criteria that make an exercise good. First, we need to be targeting one of the primary functions of the muscle we care about. For the abs as a whole, that's going to be one, spinal flexion. So making sure your back is extending and flexing during the movement is a good start. The lateral flexion of the spine, which would then target the obliques. You could certainly do rotation if you have a machine that allows for it, 
but for a lot of people, lateral flexion is going to be a better option. Next up, the target muscle group should be the limiting factor and therefore be trained close to failure. Sure, the hanging leg raise is a convenient option. You just need a pull-up bar and you can get going, but equally, your forearms can give up first. You can get a nasty lat pump that is going to have you stop the set early. There's a lot of things that can go wrong before your abs actually reach failure. Next, whatever exercise we do pick for muscle growth should be stretch friendly. And that means three things. First, it should get the target muscle group into a stretch position. Second, it should place plenty of tension in that stretch position. And finally, ideally, it would be length and partial friendly. Getting a stretch in the abs means that the exercise allows you to get a decent bit of spinal extension. Having tension there means that it's a difficult part of the range of motion. And the exercise being length and partial friendly might be beneficial as we have a line of research now suggesting that length and partials might lead to more muscle growth compared to a full range of motion. When it comes to the stretch position, some machines straight up don't allow you to get a full stretch in your abs. When it comes to the resistance curve, certain exercises are going to be better than others. For example, the ab wheel rollout is going to be most challenging in that relatively lengthened position, making it a potentially good option for ab hypertrophy. And finally, we have a couple of bonus points. These are only going to be relevant in certain situations. First, certain exercises are more time efficient than others. Generally, the exercises involving just your body weight, dumbbells, or a stack loaded machine or cable are going to be more time efficient compared to exercises that require some setup when it comes to the weight or the equipment required for the exercise, like a lot of barbell exercises. Generally, dumbbell, cables, stack load machines are going to be more time efficient. And if you're someone with limited time to train, this is fairly important. And the second bonus point is micro loadability, or essentially how small is the smallest increment you can adjust the load by relative to how much load you're using. Here, something like a bodyweight movement generally doesn't do super well, just because you're stuck with using at minimum your body weight. But ultimately, provided you're sufficiently strong to do the exercise for at least five reps per set, it's not a huge deal. You can simply progress by adding reps week to week. And indeed, a study by Plotkin and colleagues broadly shows similar hypertrophy, whether you're adding reps week to week or adding weight week to week. So for hypertrophy, micro loadability, not a huge concern. Without further ado, now that we've discussed the anatomy of the abs that then inform how we train them and the criteria that make different exercises better or worse for muscle growth, let me give you my two best picks when it comes to spinal flexion exercises. That is to say exercises that predominantly target the rectus abdominis and the obliques and then lateral flexion exercises, which will predominantly target the oblique musculature. I'm gonna give you a few options here. For spinal flexion, one great option, for example, is the cable crunch or the machine crunch if you have a good machine available. Provided you have a good machine available, both of these exercises allow you to get a full stretch in your abs by extending your spine fully. You can set them up to have a reasonable amount of tension in that position. They're both length and partial friendly. They're reasonably stable. You can easily adjust the load on them. You're not constrained by body weight. It's just a solid option all around. The main technique cue here is going to be emphasize spinal flexion and extension and not so much hip movement. Ultimately, the main function of the abs does seem to be spinal flexion. Next, we have the decline crunch. Now, this is a great option because you can both get your abs lengthened and have plenty of tension in that position, but it does come with the shortcoming of not being as micro loadable and honestly, just being a pretty hard exercise that beginners may not be able to do properly. Once again, the main technical cue on this is going to be to focus on spinal extension and flexion and not so much hip flexion and extension. And the final couple exercises I would recommend for growing the rectus abdominis musculature is going to be the dragon flag and the ab wheel rollout. While neither of these put a huge stretch on the abs, both of these movements are very challenging in that relatively lengthened position, potentially making them a decent option for hypertrophy. With that being said, with how challenging both of these are, for the rollout, you could do them either kneeling or standing, depending on how strong you are. I'm definitely doing a kneeling because, you know, bulk went too far. So while you do have some options with the rollout, not so much for the dragon flag, and so instead, if you're not strong enough for dragon flags, I would recommend the lying leg raise instead. Just like the dragon flag, this exercise is most challenging at the bottom of the rep when your abs are relatively lengthened. But for both ab and oblique work, one major tip I have to make it more engaging and less boring is to superset it with calf work. Two evil birds, one stone. By supersetting them, it becomes less boring and I find myself not enjoying it, but at least doing it, which is 
good. And finally, for the best oblique exercise for growing those obliques that you may or may not want to grow, the dumbbell side bend, either standing or seated. The seated variation may make it a little bit easier for you to focus on lateral flexion, and may also reduce fatigue ever so slightly by being seated as opposed to standing, whereas the standing variation requires less equipment. And personally, that matters to me when I train in a busy gym. Importantly, both are essentially plug and play. You grab a dumbbell and you get going. They're typically more available than the rotary torso machine, which as I mentioned earlier, is the only machine you'll often see in commercial gyms to train your obliques directly via one of their functions, minus the machine crunch. And so it's widely available. It provides you with a good stretch, essentially as good of a stretch as you can make it. Both of these variations are length and partial friendly. And as a small bonus, as Jeffrey pointed out in my reaction to his training, they do actually also train the erectors to an extent. Anyways, that is the video. I just broke down Ab Science 101, gave you some good exercises to train both your rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle and the obliques. So hopefully you should come away from this video knowing what exercises to do to maximize your ab hypertrophy. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe. Comment down below what other muscle groups you want to see me break down the best exercises for. Subscribe. I know like half of you are not subscribed to my channel watching this video right now. I will personally come to your house and start crying my eyes out about how few subscribers I have. Please just subscribe. In the meantime, have a phenomenal day, and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace.